City family. My name is Eddie Diaz. I'm one of the pastors here at Rev City. We're counting down to our service, so it's time for you to get your family, your friends, and all those that are close to you to watch the services online, all gather together as we prepare to worship together as an online community. We love all the places that people from all over the world join to watch Rev City online. And so we want to encourage you to get into that chat feature and let us know where you're watching this service from. And we greatly appreciate that. It allows us to be able to connect with you and give you a greater sense of pastoral connection to here at, at our campus. And so be sure to do that and let us know where you're at and we'll give you guys a shout out. We want you to know that just beyond participating or viewing Rev City online through your television or through your uh, computer, our heart is for you to belong to Rev City. And so to do that, one of the ways that we do that is we ask you to use our text feature and text the word Rev City to the number 94. 4,000. Then fill out the connect form. Let us know that you're out there and we'll be able to connect with you to tell you more about Rev City Church as well as Rev City Online and how you can stay connected. Additionally, if you have a prayer request, you can use that same text feature and, and choose the prompt, I need prayer, and then I will call you later in the week to pray with you online or on the phone. If you're online and want prayer, go to revcity.tv and Jim will be there to pray with you during the service today. If you want to host a watch party, don't even know what a watch party is, we'll tell you. A watch party is basically where you open up your home and invite your neighbors, your friends, your family to come in and watch a service together. We have watch parties that join us each and every week, and we want to give you an opportunity to do that, but we need to connect with you and get you the information necessary. By the way, shout out to Council Grove, who hosts one of our watch parties every single week there at their home in Council Grove. So thank you so much for doing that. If you're on Facebook, be sure to like our Facebook page and then share this service to that page. If you're on YouTube, you can do the same, but be sure also to select that bell to let you know, that lets you know anytime that we're online. On RevCity.tv, be sure to subscribe so you can get uh, information on RevCity online as well. By the way, here in just a minute, we're gonna post a link on our social media platforms for our new members luncheon that's taking place right after this service. So if you wanna stick around for that, be sure to check that, ch click that link and join us for our new members lunch to find out more about Rev City Church and Rev City Online. Well, it's about time to get into that service, so let me pray and we'll go in there. Father God, thank you so much for today's opportunity that we have to gather as an online family, to worship together, to celebrate what you're doing in and through our lives, for personal revival as well as revival in our communities. Thank you so God. Thank you so much for leading us today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll see you in the sanctuary and then I'll see you right after the service. Good morning, church. Would you all stand with us this morning? Who's ready to worship the Lord together? Hallelujah. Stop me now from bringing out my praise. I'm leaving fear at the door. Oh, it's not welcome here. I'm training sorrow and sadness for the joy of the Lord. Let's, Let's worship, worship the Lord. Lord. Come before Him with singing. Lift up your is worthy to be praised. Shout out his name, we're dancing in his freedom. And we will never, never, never stop praising his name. We'll never stop praising. I'm stepping out of my grave clothes. Stop it. 
Persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure that his joy is gonna be my strength. We're taking, take, taking back, we're taking back our joy. You crush the enemy under our feet. We're taking, take, taking back, we're taking back our joy. You crush the enemy under our feet we're taking take taking back we're taking back our joy you crush the enemy under our feet we're taking take taking back we're taking back our joy you crush the enemy under our feet we're take take taking back we're taking back our joy you crush the enemy under our feet we're taking Take it back, we're taking back our joy. You crush the enemy under our feet. Let's worship the Lord, come before we sing. Lift up your voice, he's worthy to be praised. Shout out his name, we're dancing in his freedom. Come on, and we will never. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful generations so why would he fail now he won't come on someone give a shout of praise he won't he won't i've still got joy in chaos i've got peace that makes no sense so i won't be going Stand with every 
Your nature. 
inside us speak and our fear is silent sky it's your nature you bring Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Listen. Man, isn't God good? His presence is just sweet this morning. You know, um, if you came to the ladies' conference this last weekend, um, you're going to get a little bit of a double dose of uh, encouragement that I shared. But this song, you know, has a word in it that we don't often think about in two different ways. When we hear the word barren, we think of it, you know, like when Sarah was barren in the Bible and she was not able to have children and then God did a miracle in her life. But do you know the word barren is not just a word that is associated with that meaning. I wanna read to you the definition of barren and it's kind of the second definition. It says showing no results or achievements, unproductive, bleak, and lifeless. Anybody can have barren places in their life and in their heart. And I just felt led to encourage you, if you've been in a place where you have struggled and strived and you've worked and you just are not seeing the results of your fruit, maybe you've been praying for a long time over something and it's just not happening and there's a barrenness in your heart and you found your place, yourself in a place of emptiness we sang that verse that said, I know this wasteland will bloom again. And some of us feel like we're in a place that we don't know that we ever can bloom or that situation can bloom. But can I just encourage you with something? Any time, every time, Thomas and I have walked through seasons of loss, grief, betrayal, rejection, shame, and any time I have felt in a place of barrenness or emptiness or in a wasteland, 
I can tell you on the other side of it, God didn't cause those things, but he used those things and growed us. And I can look back and I am so confident in his faithfulness. He uses those places. And can I just tell you something? Nothing is wasted on God. Nothing, nothing. I wanna read to you out of Isaiah 54. I'm gonna read to you in the message translation. I can't read the whole scripture because I don't have time. So I just took some of the verses that I felt like the Lord wanted me to speak over you today. If you've been in that place of feeling like you're in a wasteland and you don't know if it's gonna bloom again, this is his promise over you. Isaiah 54, six, I'm gonna start there. He says, don't be afraid. You're not gonna be embarrassed. Don't hold back, you're not gonna come up short. For your maker, his name, God of angel armies, your redeemer is the holy of Israel, known as God of the whole earth. You were abandoned, devastated with grief, and God welcomed you back. It's with a lasting love that he tenderly cares for you. God says, I'm promising no more anger, no more dressing you down. For even if the mountains walk away and the hills fall to pieces, my love won't walk away. My covenant commitment of peace won't fall apart. The God who has compassion on you says so. Afflicted city, storm battered, unpity. I'm about to rebuild you with stones of turquoise. Lay your foundations with sapphires. Construct your towers with rubies your gates with jewels and all of your walls with precious stones, you will be built solid and grounded in righteousness. Far from any trouble, nothing to fear. Far from terror, it won't even come close. If anyone attacks you, don't for a moment suppose that I sent them. And if anyone should attack, nothing will come of it. No weapon that can hurt you has ever been forged. I'll see to it that everything works out for the best. This is God's decree over you. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna pray over you and I wanna ask, you know that song talks about stretch your hands out and believe. Sing out, O oh barren one. Sing out, O oh broken man, and receive this promise from the Lord over your life. He's not done writing your story. I know I sound like a broken record almost every week when I get up here and say, if you're stuck in a difficult chapter, you gotta keep going. You can't stay there. But I, need, I just sense that the Lord is saying, I wanna fill you. I wanna fill you today. Where are those barren places? God, I just lift up each and every person today, God, that is just um, in that place of feeling like they're in a wasteland. God, I ask, Father, for your grace. I ask, God, that they would feel your unending love Love. I ask God that you would fill each and every one of us and that you would stir our faith to know that you're a good God, you have a good plan and a purpose, and we will no longer have those barren places in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship.
When did I start to forget All of the great things you did When did I throw away faith for the impossible And how did I start to believe You weren't sufficient for me why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? You are more than able. You are more than able. Yes, you are. Church, let's sing. You are more than able. You are. You are more than able. You are more than able. Who am I to deny? What the Lord 
one more song. Come on, give the Lord some praise. And I just feel like that the God says we're supposed to push in his presence today and not stop. Don't let the person to your left or to your right hold you back from having a meeting with the Lord today. Let's turn our eyes to him. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we turn our eyes to you. May you be glorified. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Come on, it's just you and the Lord right now. Let's sing it out. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve. worship with us. Isn't God good? Isn't he good? I will never grow tired of singing praises of my entire being to the one who holds my very life in his hands. He deserves our highest praise each and every time. Who knows if it's our last, so why not worship him like it is? Because he deserves all our praise. So come on, give him one more shout of praise. He's worthy. love you. We're glad you're here. Have a seat. Let's continue in our service through our giving and check out what's happening at Rev City. There's some amazing fall events coming up. We love you. God bless.
Rev City. We are so glad you are here today. Check out these upcoming events. Our next new members launch will be directly following the 11 a.m. service. Come learn more about Rev City's visions and values, meet our pastors, elders, and staff, and have the opportunity to become a member of Rev City Church. Lunch and childcare are provided. If you recently dedicated or rededicated your life to Jesus, sign up for water baptisms, which will take place on Sunday, September 17th. Use our text feature or visit our website to sign up. Be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to Rev City Church on social media. You'll find tons of encouragement, updates on our upcoming events, and have access to all our sermon series and Sunday services. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of our service and have a great day. Hey, Rev City friends and family. My name is Micah Barclay, and I'm one of the pastors here at Rev City. We're gonna continue our worship through bringing our tithes and giving a heart for the kingdom and legacy offerings. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Today, I want to remind all of us that giving is the verb of the Bible. God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son. James 1.17 goes as far to say that every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. As we prepare our tithes and offerings today, I want to encourage all of us with these truths. God was the first to give to us, and now we have the opportunity to give to him. We don't give out of compulsion or for something in return, but we give because God gave to us first. When we give from this place of understanding, it reminds us of how good our God really is. As Romans 8.32 says, Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? To bring your tithes and offerings, you can text the word REVCITY to the number 94000. Visit revcity.com slash give, or you can give in person today by dropping your tithes and offerings in the boxes located at each sanctuary exit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being the first to give. I pray that we would in turn be generous and give freely as you have given to us. Thank you for your son, and thank you for this opportunity to give. Now, we ask you to bless these tithes and offerings in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning, church fam. How are we doing today? Come on, we're gonna grow in our faith in Christ together today as we read the word and we're going to expect God to speak something to us today. If you have your Bible, turn or click to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and we're gonna read about the story of David and Goliath. We're gonna read the entire chapter. How many know it's a good thing to read the Bible in church? And I just believe that there's a new generation, a, a next generation that needs to hear these stories, that needs to, to know these stories so that they can build their lives upon faith in the same God who delivered people all throughout this Bible, real people with real adversity, real challenges, real weaknesses, but we're willing to turn to a real God who offers real hope, real solutions, real faith for a real future that he has for you that's filled with hope. So let's pray over God's word today. We wanna do more than just come to have church. We wanna hear from God. We wanna be strengthened in our spirit so that we can stand firm and not just stand, but begin to move forward or continue to move forward towards the promises that God has for you. There's a future that he has for you. Every one of you. Well, Pastor T, you don't know where I've been or what I'm going through. I don't, but God does. So let's turn our hearts to him, even right now as we pray before we get into God's word. I'll pray over us corporately, but let me encourage you to pray over your own life, your unique situation, circumstances, the challenges, maybe the opportunities that are before you, and inevitably the opposition that the enemy tries to present in those moments. So, so let's pray. Ask the Lord, man of God, ask God to speak to you today, to strengthen you, to strengthen you. That as we visit this passage where David slays a, a giant, that he would be speaking to you and preparing you for the giants that he's calling you to slay in your, in your family, in your marriage, in your heart, in your mind, in this community. Woman of God, just pray that the Lord would speak to you and encourage you, strengthen you, bring his grace to you to do and be everything that he's called you to do and be in every area of your life, in your workplace, in your marriage, in your family, 
in your heart, the things that he's called you to put your hands to. Lord, that's our prayer today. God, would you come and strengthen us today? Lord, thank you that anyone who's here in this room or joining online who's weak or weary or wounded in any way, any area of life, Lord, physically, spiritually, emotionally, maybe relationally, there's strain or strife in a relationship or in a marriage. God, thank you that today, Lord, you are able, God, to use an imperfect preacher, an imperfect message to reveal the heart of a good father. You bring hope, you bring healing, you bring strength, you bring freedom, and you bring faith for a future that every one of us has in you. And Lord, so we just thank you. We invite you, Lord, would you come and speak to us, God, through your word, through this, this moment. We say we're expecting, we're eagerly expecting, God, that you're gonna do something in our hearts today. In Jesus' mighty name, the name above all other names, God's precious people said, amen, amen, amen. Okay, so First Samuel chapter 17. We're gonna read quite a bit of this chapter today, so hang with me. But I think it's a good thing to, for us to take a little bit more time. No doubt I could go and kind of extrapolate just a few scriptures to kind of make some points and underline some of the theme of the message. But let's read this and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us as we read about David and Goliath. And verse 1, chapter 17, book of 1 Samuel says this. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko and Judah and Akika, Azekah rather, at Ephes Damim. And Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So there's two armies that are gathering against one another, right? And the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. And he was over nine feet tall. This was a big guy, right? And he wore a bronze helmet, bronze coat of mail, weighed 125 pounds. He wore bronze leg armor. He carried a bronze javelin upon his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and as thick as, as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. And his armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. And Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called, I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Do you know if you have God on your side, you're not only anything, you're everything that you need to be because God is with you, amen? But this is the spirit that comes against us, right? Who are you to believe God for a better future? Who are you? to believe that God is gonna do something in your life. And it's exactly the spirit that, that Goliath is coming against David with. And he says, choose one man to come down here and fight me. And if he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. And this is one of the first places we see that this passage in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus Christ. When one man would come to defeat the giants, to defeat the enemy, where one man would step into the battlefield of our life and make a way that we might experience faith and freedom and forgiveness. And it's what the battle that's presented here is the battle that's at stake in our lives too. Who are we gonna serve? Who are we gonna serve? Are we gonna live in bondage and slavery? Or are we gonna live in freedom and faith and victory as we move forward towards our future that we have in God? And so he says, I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. One man, when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, verse 12. From Bethlehem in the land of Judah, Jesse was an old man at that time. He had eight sons, Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shemia had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was, was the youngest son, and his three older brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. And for 40 days, every morning, every evening, the Philistine champion, Goliath, strutted in front of the Israelite army. And one day, Jesse said to David, take the basket of roasted grain, these 10 loaves of bread, carry them quickly to your brother's and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along. Bring back a report on how they're doing. David's brothers were there with Saul, the Israelite army, at the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd, set out early the next morning with the gifts, as Jesse, his father, had directed him. And he arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. And soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing one another, army against army, it says, David left his things with the keeper of supplies, hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks and David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant the men ask? He comes out every day to defy Israel. But the king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. And he will give that man one of his daughters for a wife. The man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. Come on, somebody sign me up for that. Say amen. 
And David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? And who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And the men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's older brother Eliab heard David talking to the men, he became angry. What are you doing around here anyways? What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know you're pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. So David's got an older brother. Haters are going to hate, right? That's what's going on here. And how dare you, David, show up and act like you're going to be the solution to the situation. But how many know all it takes sometimes is one man who's willing to stand for the truth, right? And it says that David said, what have I done? Now, I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others, asked them the same thing, received the same answer. So then David's question was reported to King Saul and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David said. I'll go fight him. And Saul said, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. He has been a man of war since his youth. Come on, when God's calling you to something, when God's stirring faith for something that he's prepared you for and he's invited you into, don't let anyone convince you that you are not enough if God is on your side. David persisted, verse 34, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club. I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw. I club it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws the Lord who rescued me, come on, from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And Saul finally considered, all right, go ahead and may the Lord be with you. And Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, took a step or two to see what it was like for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. And this just speaks to us about not trying to be something that you're not. To impress people or to kind of adhere to a pattern of expectation that the culture has for you. David knew if I try to be someone else, if I'm not true to my authentic self, to who God has made me and what the experience that he has, has uniquely and specifically and intentionally allowed me to have, that then, I, then I, I, I'm not gonna actually be able to win the battle. I can't try to do it any other way than the way that God has formed and fashioned in my heart. And so he, it, it says that, he said, I, I, can't, I can't take them. I, I, gotta, I gotta go in, in, in the strength that God's given me. And he picked up five smooth stones from a stream, put them in a shepherd's bag, armed with only his shepherd's staff and a sling. He started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out towards David with a shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt, at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, Goliath said. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. And David replied to the Philistine, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. Then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds in the wild fields and the wild animals rather. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. He rescues his people. Maybe you're here today and you need to be rescued. He's still in the business of rescuing his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. I love that David's already saying God's going to get the glory for this and I can't do it in my own strength. But something else is true here that God is still in the business of working with divine partnerships. He doesn't need us, but he chooses us to be the ones who carry out his will, who advance and further the gospel, who be the hands and feet of Jesus, who shine the light, who be the salt in the community that he's called us to in this day and hour, and he's still doing it. There's an assignment that he has for you. You're gonna need the Lord. You're gonna need his strength and just predetermine that God's gonna get all the glory, but he's still looking for just one man, one woman. Come on, one young adult who will be willing to take a stand for Jesus in your, in your locker room or in your school or, or for you and your your workplace. And it says, the, this is the Lord's battle. This is the Lord's battle. The battle you're going through today. Have you given it to the Lord? Are you recognizing that, that God wants to show up? Or are you trying to strive? Or are you trying to do it in your own? Are you trying to figure it all out yourself? Today, maybe it's a moment of surrender to just say, man, I want to involve God in my battles in a new way, in a fresh way, in a redetermined way. 
And it says that as Goliath moved closer, David quickly ran out to meet him. Come on, it implies he had confidence that he knew God was with him. He wasn't cowering. He wasn't shrinking back. He wasn't tepidly approaching the battle. He knew that God was with him. And it says, reaching into his shepherd's bag, taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling, hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in. Goliath stumbled, fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. He had no sword, but he says he ran over and he used Goliath's own sword to kill him and cut off his head. And it says, when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they turned and ran. But the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines. Isn't this a great story? Isn't this a great story? And here's what I want to encourage you with today. Giants are still being slayed. Giants are still being slayed. But you know, as I was kind of reading through this and, and studying, the Lord began to just highlight how there's something that's inevitably true. You turn back one page and, and David is being anointed to be king. But any time that God delivers a dream, a calling, or establishes a purpose in your life, he almost always starts a process. He almost always starts a process. And it's what he did in David's life. He had David back on the family farm, taking care, tending the sheep, tending the lambs. And remember what we read, he, 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 he was fighting the lions and the bears. He said, I, I, this Philistine, this, this giant named Goliath is nothing for me because I have been fighting the, the, the lions and the bears. So a few days ago, I, I had borrowed a DVD player from the church to take it home and I was watching, kind of previewing some DVDs, some curriculum that I was considering using in my men's life group that's gonna start here in a couple weeks. I wanna encourage you, get involved in a life group, do community with one another, do life with one another. Some of the greatest ways that we take strides in our faith and we grow and we get healed and restored and made whole happens outside of this room and in small gatherings with other believers. So I was previewing some of this curriculum and I, so I had the DVD player out and, and my kids saw that I had it hooked up. And so they went down in our basement. We've got this game closet and there are shelves upon shelves of old DVDs from raising kids for 17 years, all the road trips that we've taken. And, and so they're kind of dusty, but they started to just look through these old DVDs and just memories began to flood my own heart and my own mind about just sitting and watching those movies with our kids or all the road trips that we've taken as a family. And the first movie that they pulled out, believe it or not, was The Wizard of Oz. They wanted to watch The Wizard of Oz. Come on, that's a good story set in a good state. Someone say amen. So, so they, they turned on The Wizard of Oz and I, and I was struck by this scene where, where Dorothy and the straw man and the tin man are making their way forward and they, they say, do you think we'll encounter any wild animals? And the straw man says, well, probably. And, and, and he said, but we might need to be concerned about lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. And the pace kind of picks up frenetically, you know, lions and tigers and bears, lions and tigers and bears, lions and tigers and bears. So those are three things that were threatening to keep Dorothy from her destination. And here's what I want to encourage you with today. I understand it's kind of a cheesy pastor play on words, right? I'm just embracing it today. Because sometimes it's those things that help us remember and retain things the best, right? So today, if, if, if it was lions and tigers and bears, Oh my, for Dorothy, three things that can hinder us from moving forward in freedom and faith to the future we have in God, liars and fires and cares. That one of the first lions that you're going to have to defeat are the lies and the deceptions that the enemy tries to introduce to you about yourself, about your God, about your spouse. And the Bible says in 1 Peter, it says this, it says that be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, roars around, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So I love that it says may devour, it doesn't say can devour. Here's what that means to me. It means that, that he's looking for the opportunity to do it. It means he doesn't always have the capacity to do it. It doesn't imply ability, it implies opportunity. He's looking for those he may devour. Here's what it speaks to us is that there are some that he's gonna be able to devour and there are some that he are not, that he is not. And my encouragement to you is, come on, let's be found in that camp that figures out the ways to begin to live our life, build our life. Come on, we sing about it this morning on a firm foundation in a way that causes that roaring lion to come around to us and realize he is not going to be able to devour or destroy us. So, so here's what I wanna encourage you with, because remember, we're talking about liars and fires and cares. And one of the things that I believe separates those two camps, P 
people that may be devoured and people that may not be devoured is this. The opportunity we, the open doors or the opportunities that we allow through our agreement with the devil's lies and deceptions. Through our agreement with the devil's lies and deceptions. And here's what I know, in, in a room this size, there's an area of every one of our lives that there's been a lie that's been introduced about who you are, about people in your life, about who God is or who God isn't. And inevitably, this is a temptation that we all have is to kind of begin to believe something that's not true. And it begins to cause us to begin to live in a way that, that is not the, the, the full victory that God has for us. So the devil is a liar and we have to overcome liars and fires and cares. So he's the father of lies. Did you know that that's what John 8 says? That Satan is the father of lies. That he's always hated the truth. There's no truth in him. Uh, when, when it, it's consistent with his character. We sing that song about it's your nature. God's nature is to heal and restore and forgive and make new. It's his character, it's his nature to, to be a liar. It started right in the book of Genesis, about as far back as you can turn in your Bible. Genesis chapter three, the serpent, it says, verse one, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? He, he comes and he begins to introduce doubt. He comes and he begins to introduce these questions. Is God really gonna see you through? Is God really gonna come through? Is God really who he says that he is? But thankfully God responds in verse 11 and he came and he said, who told you that you were naked? And how many know that when God asks a question, he doesn't really need the answer here, he knows the answer. God's questions are always rhetorical questions, right? He was asking it for Adam's benefit. And by the way, he said, who told you? And, and I just felt encouraged to encourage maybe some of the young people, maybe you're, you're just starting your fall semester of school, you're back at university, you're, you're starting in, in high school. I wanna encourage you to be careful who you surround yourself with. And I wanna encourage you to be careful the voices that you allow yourself to hear. Because the Bible says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals and good character. My wife has said it this way for many years as we're raising our kids. She said this over the years. She said, if, she said inevitably, wrong places with the wrong faces, listening to the wrong voices will lead to wrong choices. And it's just true. You better surround yourself with people that are going to encourage you, build you up, stand with you. And so, in fact, I came across a study recently that I thought was fascinating. In 1931 is when it was accomplished, and I forget the names of the two psychologists, and probably they couldn't do, get away with this today, and I hope they had the permission of the parents, but here's what the two psychologists set out to do. Raise an infant and a chimpanzee together in the hopes that the chimpanzee would begin to learn how to walk upright, how to, how to eat with utensils, maybe even begin to speak a version of English. Six months, you can go read about it for yourself. Six months into the project, they had to abandon it because what they looked up and realized is the baby is being influenced by the chimpanzee. The baby is not developing the way that he would normally be developing. And here's the thing is you will always sink to the lowest common denominator of the company you keep. And in, in, in marriage, man, surround yourself with people who are fighting for marriage and fighting in faith. Marriages that, that endure and succeed are not marriages that don't have issues or challenges or struggles. They're ones that just say, when we get to that place, we're gonna turn to God and look to God. Surround yourself with friends who are, who are Christians and believers. Come on, for, for God's sake, please don't date or look to marry someone who's not a Christian or a believer. The company you keep matters. He says, don't be deceived, don't be deceived. Many, in other words, don't be the one who says you're gonna be the one to be able to do it because many have tried and few have succeeded. Be careful about the voices, the places, the faces, the voices that you're listening to. They're affecting your choices, right? So, so he says, who told you? He says, who told you? And, and, and inevitably, it's the, it's the serpent who, again, was more crafty, more crafty than any of the animals. In other words, he's good at his trade, right? Like if, if, if a lie was introduced into your heart or your mind about yourself, about God, about your spouse, and you just knew right away it was a lie, but he comes in with something where there's just a shred of truth to it, right? There's just a little bit of evidence to go along with the lie. And, and, and we kind of begin to, to maybe uh, adopt these things. And, and here's the thing I wanna encourage you with is that, remember what we read, John 8, he's the father of lies, right? He's the father of lies. So what does that mean? So, so here's what I think it means. It's the only place in the Bible where, where Satan's described like this. He's the father of lies. So here, here's what it means to me. It's one of the few places that he has creative ability. 
It's one of the few places where he has creative ability. What do you mean, Pastor T? It means when he introduces a lie, he has creative ability. Sometimes he'll even produce evidence to back up the lie. So, so let me show you, let me show you. Let, let me show you a place where this happened. Genesis chapter 37, you remember the story of Joseph. Joseph had a dream. Joseph had favor with his father, remember? And his brothers began to despise him from it. Maybe he kind of overshared some of the good, big things, dreams that God had put in his heart. He might have done better to just kind of keep that quiet, you know, and just trust God's timing for releasing him into those things. But nonetheless, his brothers began to devise a plan. Remember, they said, let's kill him. They said, no, there's no profit in that. Let's throw him in this pit. Let's convince dad that he's dead. Let's sell him into slavery. It gets rid of our problem and it prospers us financially. So, so that's where we pick up the story in verse 31. It says, the brothers killed a young goat, dipped Joseph's robe, that coat of many colors, remember? in its blood, and watch what they did. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? And their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it is my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Was Joseph eaten? No. And watch what he says. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Where has the enemy introduced something into your life that you've immediately just taken it at face value and said, well, clearly God's done with me. Well, clearly the relationship is over. Well, clearly it's just gonna mean bankruptcy for us. Well, clearly that's exactly what happened right here, right? What, was Joseph really dead? And in fact, Joseph was not only not dead, but God was orchestrating a plan behind the scenes to prepare and connect Joseph to the purpose for his life. God was using the pit, God was using the pain to prepare him for the palace, right? Because that's the end of the story. Joseph gets promoted out of the pit to the palace. God puts favor and promotion on his life. And it's where we look at the end of the story, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, where it says, we, we kind of glean this concept out of that scripture that what the enemy meant for evil, God will use for good. Come on, if you're grateful for that promise from God, give the Lord some praise. So, so he's the father of lies. He's, he's the roaring lion. And we have to begin to discern, does this align with the truth of God's word? The enemy doubled down on this in Joseph's life. In Genesis chapter 39, he's escaped the pit, he's made it to the palace. And remember Potiphar's wife. Joseph was serving in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar, or Potiphar's wife rather kind of got infatuated with David, attracted to him in an unhealthy way. And verse 10, it says, Potiphar's wife kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her. And he, he kept out of her way as much as possible. That was a good decision by Joseph, right? And, and it says, but one day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. He's just minding his business. He, he's just doing, doing what he does, right? And, and, and she, she, it says that she came and she, she grabbed him by the cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. And, and Joseph tore himself away. But he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. And come on, we got to run from those kind of situations, right? But watch what the enemy does again. It says, when she saw she was holding his cloak, has, has Joseph done anything wrong? No. But as, as he was running, his cloak tore away and she's holding it. And she called out to her servants and all the men came running. She said, look, she said, look, I've got the evidence. My husband has brought this Hebrew slave, Joseph, here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed, was that true? It wasn't true at all. When he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. Here's what I wanna encourage you with. Just because you can see it doesn't mean you have to believe it. Both cases in Joseph's life, right? Well, here's the bloody coat of many colors. Joseph must be dead. Well, here's the robe. Joseph must have come and tried to perpetrate this evil thing against Potiphar's wife. You might really have the MRI. You might really have the stack of bills. You might really be facing strife in your relationship. You might really have kids or grandkids that are far from God. But I'm telling you today, we walk by faith and not by sight. And we got to begin to do, to take up Jesus on his invitation, where in John chapter 8, he says, you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So that's, that's a good promise, right? Right? You know the truth, the truth will make you free. So that's verse 32. So we back up to verse 31. Here's the pretext if we want to walk in the promise. Here, here's the pattern that God calls us 
to walk in. And it says, verse 31, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so we've got to, he says, abide in, in my word. And I'm just telling you, this is a season for us to get real with God. This is a season for us to, to go deeper with God, to draw nearer to God. This is a time for us to be found on our knees in prayer for our families and our communities. This is a time for us to dust off our Bible and once again begin to read these stories and begin to read about the heart of God and the promises of God. He says, if you'll abide with me, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. In other words, here's what he's saying. If you know the truth, you'll be more readily able to recognize the lies. And did you know that when they're training treasury agents, to learn how to recognize counterfeit money, you know what they actually do? They have them deal with and handle as much real money as possible. Because if you get familiar with the real thing, with the truth, with the real thing, when a counterfeit begins to come across your hands, you begin to recognize, listen, that's not, that doesn't line up, that's not real, something's off, something's fishy, something's funny right there. And it's what we have to begin to do as the people of God so when that little lie, maybe even accompanied with a little evidence, begins to hit our heart, hit our mind, attack our relationship, we're so familiar, we've abided in the word of God, we begin to recognize that's a counterfeit truth, that's a lie from the enemy, that's not who God is, that's not what God said, that's not my future in Jesus' mighty name. We got to get back into the word of God, abiding in the word of God. It's the way that we will disarm the roaring lion. Number two, fires, liars, fires, and cares. Isaiah 43 verse two says this, when you go through the deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. And we haven't done anyone any favors by encouraging people or not, or failing rather to disclose that Jesus said we'd have trials, Right? Temptations, tribulations, even persecutions. Jesus said all those things. So here's, here's what the Christian life is. It's not the absence of problems. It's the presence of a person in the midst of your problems whose name is Jesus, and he's going to see you through, through the deep waters, through the difficulty, through the fires. David, you remember, he, he said, he said, um, God's, he said, God will deliver this giant in my hands because God's rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear. God's rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear. And, you know, I, as I kind of pictured this as I was growing up in Sunday school and hearing this story, I think I had an over-sterilized version of David fighting the lions and the bears. You know what I'm saying? Like kind of a, a, a G-rated version of it. Like he just kind of like slapped the bear or the lion or punched him in the nose and the lion ran off or fell over dead or whatever. Here's what I wanna encourage you with. It probably looked a lot different than that. David probably had to fight with all his might. He had to bear down. He had to persevere. He had to endure. Is it possible that, that David survived, but he was not unscathed? Is it possible that he had some scars from some of those battles? He survived, but he was not unscathed. And I'm telling you today, if you're going through hell, don't stop. If you're going through a fight, don't stop fighting. Don't quit. Don't give in. Keep fighting. Keep asking God to show up on your behalf. Some of you think you're in trouble. The lions and the bears are coming after you. And some of you think you're in trouble, but God says you're in training. You're in training. You're in training. He sent some lions. He sent some bears. He's going to grace you. He's going to help you. You might have some scars, but when you get to the other side, when you get to that land where the giant, the nine foot giant, the big hairy audacious thing that's in your life, you're going to be able to look back and say, I might have some scars. I survived, but I was not unscathed. And these scars now represent those moments where the enemy was trying desperately to keep me from pursuing my destiny and my future in God. And now they represent a God who showed up and helped me, who healed me, who saw me through. Come on, who has some scars in this room? today and you can look back and say I thought I wasn't going to make it I didn't know if I was going to make it but now I look back and I see that God was with me I thought I was in trouble but I really was in training life is not the absence of problems for the Christian it's the presence of a person he's going to see you through liars and fires and cares cares Matthew 13 and Jesus is telling the parable about the kingdom of God. He's saying, it's like seed. And remember, he talked about seed that's thrown on, on, on hard ground. He talked about seed that, came, that sprouted up quickly and then withered away because it did not have roots. And he says in verse 22, he says, as for the seeds that were sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world 
and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, it bears repeating before I dig into this. Poverty and lack are not virtuous in God's kingdom. A willingness to kind of be content with what you have, a willingness to give and sacrifice, that's virtuous. But poverty and lack are not virtues in God's kingdom. If you think they're virtues in God's kingdom, go visit a third world country and just watch. Look at all the crime and, and the sickness and the disease. Poverty and lack are not virtues in God's kingdom. We need kingdom-minded, Christian, Christ-following, builders, entrepreneurs, owners of companies who are prospering greatly so that they can be a blessing to their family, their community, to their churches, to advance the gospel to further the kingdom of God. We, the Bible says that it is him who gives us the power to create wealth. The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. It just says the love of money is the root of all evil. So let's just establish that, all right, that God is, doesn't despise greatness or prosperity. He just resists pride. That's just us kind of placing our trust and our faith in the systems or the structures or the resources of the world, right? So he says, it's like one who hears the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word out, and it becomes unfruitful. In Luke 18, we find a passage where Jesus is speaking with the rich young ruler, and that's how we know him, right? And remember, I'll, I'll, just to paraphrase the backstory. The, the rich young ruler has said, how do I be righteous? And Jesus said, well, you need to do this, 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 and this. He said, I've done all those things. And Jesus said, well, there's one thing you're yet to do, and that's sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And it says that the man became greatly perplexed and it, because he was very wealthy. And he made a decision right there that he was going to prioritize the systems and the status and the structures and the definitions of success that the world offered over the significance that Jesus was offering him. And you know, I, I, there might be a little bit of liberty that I'm taking with this, but a, a few years ago, I feel like as I was studying this passage, the Holy Spirit really showed me something, spoke to me something. We know him as the rich young ruler, right? And, and, and I feel like the Lord said, if he had been willing to say yes to what I was calling him to, he would have been one of the men that I was willing to use to write the New Testament. And we would not just know him by some generic term, we would know his name. And when I told you to turn in your Bible to whatever, there was, there was an invitation. These were not empty words. These were not hollow words. Jesus really meant what he said when later on in that verse, later on in that chapter, he said, no one has left their family, has sold their belongings to follow me that will not receive many times over in this life and for all of eternity. Man, can we just commit that we're not going to be a people that cling so tightly to the temporal things, to the possessions and the power, to the applause of people. When Jesus says, hey, come and follow me. Come and, and, and surrender what you have. Come and be a part. It's an invitation. It's not an obligation. We don't have to do this. But do we really believe that Jesus meant what he said when he said, man, there's a blessing on the other side of obedience. And the things that you're, you're hoping for, the things that you're clinging to, there's something more. The world is concerned with status and success. And God is calling us to a life of significance. And there's no way, there's nothing that we can do, there's nothing we can put our time to, or our hands to, that's more significant than furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because everything we can build on this side of eternity is all temporal. It's fleeting, it's passing. He says the deceitfulness of riches. What's the deceit of riches? That there's an amount, that there's a position, that there's a title that will fill the hole in your soul, that will heal the hole in your heart, or that will connect you to a life of purpose and significance. He says it's it's the deceit of riches, none of those things. The only thing that really does that is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, he wants to prosper you. We need a church filled, come on, with people who are prospering. But let's ask ourselves this question, how much can God bless me with and I still desperately pursue him in good times when I've got the resources, when I'm getting the promotion, when the favor of God is on my life? Come on, there's some of you, the favor of God is gonna rest mightily on your life. The Bible says, I has not seen or ear heard the, the, the things that God has in his heart for you. 
I mean, some of you, young, young people, listen to me. Come on, who, who wants to identify as a young person today? I'm raising my hand. I'm, I got my attention. Young people, listen to me. There are some of you that the Lord is gonna pour out tremendous favor, promotion, resources upon. Make up your mind today that just like David said, it's gonna be by my hand, but it's gonna be because of God's hand on my life. And make up your mind today, determine this. The light that shines from within you will be brighter than the light that shines upon you. And just watch as you make that determination what God's gonna do in your life. Come on, don't you believe it? We need a generation to get back to these stories and to get back to these principles and get back to these patterns, to be willing to take a stand. No one else was willing to take a stand. He said, I just need one man, just one man, just one person, just one woman. You'd be surprised. There's, there's some things that God wants to do in your life and you, 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 there's a version of you that God sees in his heart that you are yet to meet. And he's calling you today to step into it. Don't limit what God can do through you. David didn't wake up that day and say, today's the day I go and I kill the giant. He woke up and he heard his father give him a simple command and an errand. I mean, call it what, he was a pizza delivery boy for God's sake, that's what he was doing. Take this bread and cheese to your brother's camp. He was, he was DoorDash, you know? But he was willing to say yes to the, to the small things. He was willing to say yes to the seemingly insignificant things. What, what today is he, he calling you to? An errand for David, an errand led to an, the encounter with God. What's he put in your hand? What's he invited you to today? He's preparing you. He's preparing you and he's positioning you and he's still slaying giants. He's still slaying giants. Would you stand to your feet this morning and, or this afternoon now, I guess? As you're standing, would you do what is often our custom? Would you just ask the Lord, just say, Lord, what are you speaking to me today? What are you speaking to me? And I just wanna give you just a little space just to allow him to speak to you. And Maybe as he's speaking to you, and maybe you wanna just even kind of lift your hands just like this, just a simple posture that I ask us to get into frequently because it's, it's profound in that this, this posture like this before God is a posture of presenting things that we've held on to, hurts, wounds, bitterness, unforgiveness. And in that same moment, that same posture, we're preparing ourselves to receive whatever it is that God wants to speak to you or do in you. It's also the international sign for surrender. We're just surrendering our lives today, a fresh and new way. And Lord, I just, as people are in a posture of receiving today, I wanna just thank you for the opportunity to partner with you and just declare that the lies of the enemy, where's he lied to you? Where's he even presented evidence of a lie? And you've bit into that thing and you've bought into that thing. And today, he wants to speak the truth over you, that you are loved, that you are chosen, that there's a hope-filled future that he has for you, that you're not too far gone, that you're not too far lost, that there's no lost causes in the kingdom of God, that there's no one that's beyond the love of Jesus to reach, to be rescued, to be restored. Lord, thank you that today you're just, you're overcoming those lies with the truth of your love your forgiveness, your faithfulness. Lord, people who are, are going through a fire, they're in a season, unforeseen, unexpected, unfair. Lord, they don't know where to turn and what to do. Lord, thank you today that you're just reminding us you'll be with us. You didn't promise us we wouldn't go through those seasons, but you did say you would be with us. And Lord, I pray that this would just be a moment, a day, an hour, Lord, where we would just become more aware, God, of your presence with us. That, that, that it's not the absence of the problem, it's the presence of the person. You're gonna see us through and see us too, God. And Lord, that some of us that maybe have gotten kind of caught up in the cares of the world, it's stolen our attention. We believe in you, but we're really not serving you. 
And today, Lord, we just, if that's us, we just say in many ways, maybe it's all of us to a degree, we just say we repent. Lord, help us to once again seek first your kingdom, Lord, and trust you, Lord, that you're gonna take care of all the other things that the world says we need. You see, you know, God, you've got a plan, you've got a future for us, God. And while you're staying on just that moment of receiving, I wanna give people the opportunity, the most important thing we ever do because it affects all of eternity. Some of these principles and these things are gonna help us in this life on this side of eternity. Jesus came to give abundant life, right? But he also came, he said, to seek and save the lost, to seek and save the lost. And, and some of you, if you're here today and you're, you're weighed down by sin, you're far from God, Today is your opportunity to receive the free gift of salvation. You don't get good to get God. You don't, you, you don't earn or deserve. Jesus can't, comes into our darkest moments. He comes to where we're at and he shows us the love of the Father and he extends perfect forgiveness and reconciliation back into a relationship with our heavenly Father. So maybe that's you or maybe you're here today and you've drifted from God. You believe in him, you once knew him, loved him, maybe even served him, but you've, you, you've gotten caught up with the cares of this world, maybe made some bad decisions, bad choices. For whatever it is, you're just far from him. And if that's you, you're what Jesus described in the parable of the prodigal son. And if that's you, today the posture of the father today is the same as that father in that parable. Arms wide open, eagerly looking for, anticipating, expecting that moment, this moment for you when you would just take one step back towards him. And that father ran and embraced that wayward one, welcomed him home, put a ring on his finger, put a royal robe around his back, called the royal festival, invited all the neighbors, said, come, we must celebrate because my son has come home. And if that's you today, that's the heart of God towards you. So right now, if that's you, you, you need to be forgiven a new life, a fresh start, complete forgiveness, washed clean, made whole, made new, or you need to come back into your father's house right now. Don't wait, don't wait, don't delay. This is important for you. Lift your hand high towards heaven. You're not responding to a preacher. You're responding to your heavenly father. You need to be forgiven, made new. You need to come home back into the arms of your father. He's waiting. He's longing for you. He's, he's here in this moment. Thank you, Lord, for these precious people. Thank you, Lord, for what these hands represent, Lord. That's an outward sign of a powerful inward work that you're doing in people's hearts. If you raised your hand in the room, you can lower it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray this prayer with you. We do it by design because we want you to hear the sound of a family coming alongside you right from the start. And we pray for a second reason every week together as a family because we just, we recognize, it helps us recognize and stay anchored to the reality that even though God's building us, growing us in our faith, we never graduate from grace. The foundation of our faith is unmerited grace. So let, come on, some, some amazing people, some amazing people came home to their father, said yes to Christ today. Let's pray this prayer. Pray with them maybe a little more boldness than we normally do. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could never pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you my life, I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, come on, say this part loudly, I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. And now come on, we rejoice with all of heaven for those of you who put your faith in Christ. Man, what a great service. We hope that you enjoyed our worship today and hope that you enjoyed that message as well. And you heard Amity. Listen, if you dedicated your life to Jesus Christ, we want to put a Bible in your hand. So text the word Rev City to the number 94,000, fill out that form, and tell, them that you, tell us that you, wanted, that you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. We will send you that Bible in the mail this week. If you were a guest this first time, thank you so much for joining us. And we also can you, uh, encourage you to use that same text feature and say that you want to connect. And we'll send you information about Rev City Church and Rev City Online. Well, we're getting ready for our new members luncheon. So hopefully you'll be able to check out, stay with us for a few minute, moments. Click that link at 1145 and you'll be, or 1245 and you'll be connected right to that service. And we'll get started with our new members luncheon so shortly. Hope that you had a great time today. We'll see you next week on the same platforms. God bless you guys. Have a great week.